Hello, I'm Larry Levitt, Executive Vice President of KFF, the Kaiser Family Foundation. Welcome to the release of our 2021 Employer Health Benefits Survey. This is the 23rd year we've been doing this survey, almost a quarter of a century. We've tracked the acceleration and deceleration in premium trends, the dramatic rise in deductibles over time, the passage of the Affordable Care Act, and now the effects of a pandemic. Somewhat surprisingly, in the midst of an upending of so much of our lives from COVID-19, employer health coverage and costs have been remarkably stable in the last year and a half. Yet after years of upward trends, premiums and deductibles are a struggle for many, and employers and workers are grappling with mental health and many other issues in the wake of the pandemic. As the most comprehensive compendium of the details of employer-sponsored health benefits, our survey deals with all of these issues. In addition to the presentation today, you can find all the details online and in an article published in the journal Health Affairs. A few housekeeping details before we get to the survey results. This briefing is being recorded and will be posted on kff.org later today. Everyone who registered will get an email when it's ready. And if you have any questions uh, during the presentations, uh, please submit them via the Zoom Q&A function at any time. Now I'm going to turn it over to Matthew Ray, Associate Director of KFF's program on the healthcare marketplace, and KFF Senior Vice President Gary Claxton. Thanks, Larry. My name is Matthew Ray. I'm an Associate Director at the Foundation, and I'm an author of the study. So we'll get started with uh, the cost of coverage. So to the first slide. One more slide. So uh, in 2021, single coverage premiums were just over seven thousand seven hundred dollars and family premiums top 22,000. Workers and employers typically share this cost, but no matter how you slice it, the aggregate cost of covering a family adds up. Over the years, we've compared the cost of family family coverage, the premium to the cost of a new car. And this year, the annual cost to cover a family of four is almost the same as a Honda Civic. Next slide. Compared to the rapid premium increases of the early 2000s, we saw relatively modest premium increases this year. On average, family premiums increased about 900 bucks or 4%. So that's the, uh, the represented by the orange line. You can compare this to a 5% increase in workers' earnings and roughly a 2% increase in inflation through the first three months of the year. Next slide. So one explanation for the relatively low levels of growth is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on healthcare use. Following stay-at-home orders last year, many hospitals and healthcare providers saw an unprecedented decrease in the use of some health services. We asked employers between January and July when we fielded the survey, whether utilization was above or below their expectations during the last quarter, the last quarter since we asked them. So about a third of large employers said that healthcare utilization was still below what they had anticipated. And this may be contributing to lower premium increases. Next slide. Even low levels of premium growth add up over time. Since we've been doing this survey for an amazing 23 years, uh, we've seen a 284% increase in premiums. This increase far outpaces the growth in either workers' wages, earnings, or inflation. Next slide. So there's a lot of variation in the family coverage premium and around these averages. We have tons of detail on average premiums for various types of firms and for workers at various types of firms. This looks at the overall uh, distribution of premiums for all covered workers. So one in five covered workers are enrolled in a plan with a family coverage premium topping $26,500. So on the far side, and then 5% of workers are enrolled in a plan with a premium of less than $14,000. Much more detail here in the full report. Next slide. So moving on to not how much the premium costs, but how much workers have to chip in. The slide looks at how much both workers and employers are contributing to the cost. So on average, worker premium contributions constitute 28% of the family coverage premium. So that's the light blue is how much the workers chipping in and the dark blue is how much the employer is chipping in. So both have increased over time. On average, a uh, covered worker is paying just about $6,000 towards the premium to roll his or her family in 2021. And the employer is chipping in the rest. Next slide. 
So covered workers can be asked to cover vastly different portions of the premiums at different firms. Um, one of the ways that, that this is important is, is in regards to small firms. So covered workers at small firms often face relatively high premium contributions to include dependents. Three in 10 covered workers at small firms contribute more than half the premium for family coverage. So that would be the fourth bar down. The, the, the dark blue represents uh, workers who are contributing more than half the premium. Next slide. The other way plan employees use healthcare, uh, the other way that uh, plan employees pay for healthcare is cost sharing when they use services. One of the big forms of cost sharing is deductibles in addition to co-pays and co-insurances. Deductibles in particular have grown over recent years. So among workers with a uh, general annual deductible for single coverage, the average deductible is just about $1,700. That's the dark blue line. So on average, uh, a worker with a deductible is has a single coverage deductible of $1,669. Over time, both the percent of covered workers with a deductible and the average deductible have increased. We can look at these trends together by taking the average deductible for all workers, assigning a zero for workers without a deductible. Among all covered workers, the average deductible is over $1,400 this year. That's the light blue line. So about 85% of covered workers in 2021 face a deductible uh, general annual deductible for single coverage. Next slide. So somewhat importantly is the rise of sort of high deductibles. So over time, more covered work workers are enrolled in plans which require relatively high deductibles before the plan covers most services. So the dark blue boxes here are small firms, those firms with three to 199 employees. The light blue is large firms, firms with 200 or more employees. And what we see is uh, small firms typically have more covered workers enrolled in plans with relatively high deductibles. So in 2021, more than a quarter of all workers, uh, all covered workers, including nearly half of those at small firms are in a plan with a deductible of at least $2,000. That amount is about four times the share who faced uh, such a threshold in 2009. A particular note uh, uh, is the, the, the last dark blue bar on the, on the far right here is that more than a, a quarter of covered workers at small firms now have a deductible of $3,000 or more. Next slide. One reason for increasing deductibles is the higher share of workers enrolled in high deductible health plans with a savings option. So the survey defines uh, high deductible health plans with a savings option as its own plan type. These are plans that are either HSA qualified or have a high deductible and are paired with a healthy investment arrangement. So high deductible health plans with a savings option have grown over time and now cover almost three in 10 workers. The other plan types have shrunk over time in, in, um, in response. PPOs have remained the most common plan type for covered workers at both small and large firms, enrolling just about half of covered workers. And I'm going to pass it off to Gary. He's going to talk about co coverage, eligibility, and all the things that changed because of COVID. Um, hi, this is Gary Claxton. Um, sorry, um, I'm a senior vice president with the foundation. Um, about 60% of firms offer health benefits to at least some of their workers. Uh, small firms are much less likely to offer than larger firms. Um, this is among firms with three or more employees. Um, looked at a different way, about 91% of workers work for firms with three or more employees, work for a firm that covers some of their employees. Uh, next slide, please. Um, not all workers are covered even when a firm does offer. Um, about 81% of workers are eligible in firms that offer health benefits are eligible to enroll in the benefits and about 62% of them do. These numbers are similar to what we've seen in previous years. Next slide, please. Uh, the next few slides relate to COVID-19 and to changes that employers made to their programs in response to the work and social disruptions caused by the pandemic. We asked firms about changes they made to, to different programs after the start of the pandemic. So some of these changes may have been made last year and some of them may have been put in place just for this current plan year. 
Among firms of 50 or more workers with a wellness program, over half reported making some change in response to the pandemic. This includes 43% that provided or expanded online counseling focused on emotional, financial, or other stresses, 22% that expanded or modified their programs to better tailor them for people working at home, such as home, you know, exercises you can do at home, um, meals, things like that. And 17% added new digital content or apps for, for their wellness programs. Next slide, please. Well, there's been a lot of concern about the emotional and financial stresses people faced and continue to face during the pandemic. We asked firms of 50 or more workers if they had seen an increase in employees seeking mental health or substance abuse services um, since, the, since the pandemic began. Although there were quite a few respondents that were unsure of the answer, 38% of large firms saw an increase for mental health services and 7% saw an increase for substance abuse services. While we can't be sure, we expect that the that in this case, the differences across firm sizes isn't really related to service use, but to the fact that larger firms are more likely to be aware of their current claims patterns and for the reasons people are seeking care. Uh, next slide, please. Um, prior to the pandemic, there was a great deal of attention being paid to opioid and other addictions. And the isolation and stresses from the pandemic may have made this problem worse. So we asked employers of 50 more workers if they were concerned about the growth of substance abuse issues among their workers. As you saw in the last slide, although relatively few um, small shares of employers say they saw an increase in workers seeking services for substance abuse, about a quarter of all firms and almost half of larger firms said that they were concerned about the growth of substance abuse among their workers. This is an issue we're gonna follow up on next year and something to pay attention to. Uh, next slide, please. Almost 40% of firms offering health benefits with 50 or more employers, employees, excuse me, made some change to their mental health benefits in response to the pandemic, including 31% that expanded the ways that employees could receive services, such as through telehealth, and 18% that developed new resources, such as newer or expanded employee assistance programs. Smaller shares made other changes, such as expanding the number of service providers in their networks or waiving cost sharing. Uh, next slide, please. The share of firms offering telemedicine benefits has grown considerably in recent years, but the use of the services had been modest prior to the pandemic. Um, all that obviously changed during the early stages of the pandemic when the use of telemedicine literally exploded due to both patient and provider concerns about COVID. More recently, the use of benefits is moderated to some extent, and that sort of begs the question about the role of these services going forward. Um, when asked, almost half of employers with 50 or more employees said that the telemedicine would be very important to providing access in the coming years, and another 31 said that it would be important. So employers clearly view these services as something that's here to stay. We'll, we'll both We'll continue to follow up on this to see how it works out. Next slide, please. 95% of firms offer telemedicine benefits in 2021. Among these, 65% took steps to promote the use of these services in response to the pandemic. About one half increased communications to employees about telemedicine benefits. 31% covered additional modes of communications for delivering services, such as more video or even um, phone services. 24% expanded the settings or locations where services could be used. 23% expanded the number or types of providers that could provide services that were covered by the benefit. And 23% expanded the number of services that could be provided. Uh, next slide, please. Another area where firms made changes due to COVID was in their biometric screening programs. These programs have incentives for employees to get screened for certain health markers, such as cholesterol, weight, or blood pressure. The share of firms with a biometric screening program fell considerably in 2021, likely because employers recognized the difficulties employees faced in getting screening during the lockdown periods and the reluctance of people to seek non-emergency services. Um, this had been pretty steady, as you can see, for a few years, and then it just dropped. Um, next slide, please. 
And other changes made by employers with biometric screening programs also show concerns about employees being able to comply with screening requirements. These include broadening the number of providers that could provide screens, using digital platforms for, cre for screening requirements, or reducing the stringency of requirements or the incentives for completing the screenings. So I think we'll see next year if these programs start to come back or whether there's still concerns about um, people being able to get, to get their screenings. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, turning to a different issue, um, the Trump administration instituted rules that would require hospitals and payers to make actual price information more available to um, patients prior to seeking services, um, so-called the transparency rules. When asked about the potential effectiveness of this approach, about a quarter of large firms said that providing workers with information about the cost of services could help their decision making a great deal. But only 3% said it, that it would reduce health spending a great deal. Uh, there were much larger shares that thought the approach would be somewhat effective in both cases. Um, it's, just a, it's a bit of an interesting um, juxtaposition. So we'll see how this plays out because the employer requirements have been delayed a bit. And it's probably take a few years before this stuff is really, is really effective, but this is how people are looking at it going into it. Next slide, please. 64% um, of covered workers are in a self-funded plan um, in 2021. So it's, it's a lower percentage than last year, but reasonably consistent with other recent years. Large firms are much more likely to be self-funded than smaller firms. Uh, next slide. Um, that said, in recent years, insurers have devised ways to offer ostensibly self-funded plans to very small employers, down to employees, employers with five or fewer employees, sometimes even to employers with only one or only two or three employees. These arrangements, sometimes referred to as level premium plans, include a small self-funded core that's tightly wrapped in a couple of stop-loss policies that largely eliminate any upside risk for the employer. These plans are medically underwritten, so they use health status and rating and in determining whether to accept the employer applicants, and do not necessarily cover the essential health benefits required of insured plans in the small group market. In 2021, 38% of workers covered in, in small employer plans were in a level-funded plan. This is a large increase over the previous year. Um, so it's something that we're gonna watch closely next year and the year after because it would have pretty big implications for the small group market. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Terrific, thanks uh, Gary and Matt. And uh, as a reminder, which you see on the screen, uh, you can submit questions at any time using the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the, the Zoom app. Um, so we do have a number of questions uh, already, uh, kind of many, many revolving around uh, high deductibles and um, uh, HSA qualified plans with, with a savings option. Um, so uh, first question, you know, Matt, you talked about uh, the, the share of workers who are in high deductible plans with a savings option. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the fact that there are people in high deductible plans without a savings option uh, and, and why an employer might, uh, you know, increase the deductible but not offer an HSA qualified plan or, or an HRA? No, it's, a good, it's a good question. So we've seen a growth in deductibles among all plan types. So no matter what plan type you're in, your deductible is higher than it was on average um, five or 10 years ago in most cases. We've also seen more covered workers move to these HSA qualified plans. So, and that the HSA qualified plan can make a big deal if the employer makes a contribution. So a sizable chunk of employers who are offering HSA qualified plans then make an HSA contribution on behalf of the employee that the employee can use to sort of offset their cost sharing in the current plan year or in the HSA, HSA, HSA say they're going forward for when they do have health spending. And that can really dampen the impact of the big deductible. So many, many employers, I think, think of that when they make a transition to an HSA qualified plan. We've also seen this massive growth in deductibles um, over not the last three years, but we saw this sort of rapid increase from 2006 to about 2018 with deductibles just taking off even faster than premiums and much, much faster than workers' wages and inflation. So, you know, obviously 
this is one of the levers that an employer has if they want to reduce the, the cost of their plan is to, to increase the cost sharing. And I think that's why we've seen this or part of the reason why uh, we've seen sort of the increase in deductibles throughout. Part of the issue with ASOS qualified plans that they have other restrictions that the employer may or may not want to make, uh, other federal rules and requirements that they have to have to, to meet to make the plan HSA qualified. And Matt, do we, do we have uh, data, you may not have it at your fingertips, on, on uh, when employers do offer an HSA qualified plan, um, is it the norm that they contribute towards, uh, towards the health savings account for their workers? Um, it's in, uh, so for all of, you, all of you who are online, I believe it's exhibit 8.10 has that, has exactly that. We have a bunch of distribution graphs that break out the size of the, uh, the, the contribution. The HRAs are less, fewer workers are enrolled in the plan with the HRA, the health reimbursement arrangement. This accounts are structured differently. But in that, in that case, all employers are, are making money available for the worker. Yeah, if you go to section eight of the report, it has the contributions for, it has the average contributions, the share of employers that make contributions, the share of employees that receive contributions and the average sizes and things like that. But there are, if I remember, I think there's a good third of employees in an HSA qualified plan who don't receive a contribution, but I, I, I'd have to check. Um, right now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as I said, that, that information, uh, I mean, the, the, full, the full report with uh, more, more information than you could possibly imagine is, is available on kff.org. Um, so, so, sorry, Dali, it's one in five. So one in five covered workers okay. are enrolled in a high debt health plan sort of an HSA qualified plan that where they do not get any contribution. And in many cases, the, the deductible is still significant even after whatever the contribution is. Terrific. Um, and, you know, the, the um, I mean, as you mentioned, the, the, uh, the increase in deductibles has, has slowed somewhat in, in recent years. Uh, any theories on, on why that might be the case? Um, I, I can, I think that at least listening, when I listen to employers talking and things like that, I think they're worried that the deductible levels have kind of reached a, a, a level where it's a, it's a concern for their lower wage workers. I mean, you, you've got this, you've got this, you want to make a plan that's affordable for them. So the contribution is not too high, but if the way you have to do that is to make the cost sharing high, that doesn't make them want to enroll or appreciate the plan. And I, I always try to remind myself that you have employee benefits because you want your employees to like them, not because you want them to feel like it's not a good thing for them. So I, I think there's a really a struggle to try to find ways to make coverage affordable without increasing cost sharing much more. A lot of our other work at the foundation obviously looks at the affordability of cost sharing. And we find that even among people in employer plans, many times like, have the, the markers of having affordability problems when they want to use services. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, we also had a, a number of questions about uh, about wellness wellness benefits. Um, so one question was whether we we have any information on the specific types of, of wellness or telemedicine services uh, by con condition, for example, mental health, diabetes prevention, uh, et cetera. Any any further details on that? Uh, we ask about seven or eight specific wellness programs, and that's included in Chapter 12, I think. 12, yeah. Uh, um, we don't, on telemedicine, we haven't asked specifically about what it, what it covers. Um, we, we may be doing more of that going forward as... I mean, obviously, like I said, it, it, it really took off during the pandemic. It's slowing down from what we understand, although some of the mental health parts are continuing to be reasonably strong. Um, we're doing some other work, which we'll, we'll be releasing relatively soon with um, a service provider that would provide more detail about this. Um, so uh, it, it's something we'll know more about, but we don't have more information about the telemedicine now. And have you seen, you know, uh, there are a couple of questions about this, particularly with, with COVID um, and a, a greater focus on, on racial equity and social determinants of health and, um, 
uh, particularly issues like food insecurity. Um, have we, did we ask in the survey or have you seen any employers uh, look to, to address those issues in the, in the context of their, their health benefits? Um, we didn't ask. Uh, we haven't. It, it, it's not an issue. We those, those are not issues we've addressed. We we have in the past asked whether or not there are um, program. There are ways of reducing either contributions or cost sharing for some of the lower wage employees, um, which is which is not in any way in that level of detail. And but we didn't ask that question this year. Um, but we, we have it from previous years and um, we could certainly provide that information. Great. And um, so, we, you know, I had a number of questions, not, not surprisingly, about uh, affordability. And as Matt said, you know, it's certainly an issue KFF has done a, a lot of work on. Um, so a couple questions about this. One, one is um, the employee share, um, both premium and out-of-pocket costs. Um, how have that? How how has that changed uh, over time? Um, and, and also about the, the the premium increase of of four percent, um, you know, which sounds relatively small, particularly in the context of um, uh, inflation increases of of six percent uh, year over year just announced today. Um, but uh, looking at, at particular workers, you know, particularly low income workers. Um, uh, what are some of the affordability challenges that that those those workers face, e even in the context of a relatively modest premium increase? Yeah, we found this in the past. I, I, I'd have to check if it's statistically significant this year, but over time, we've definitely found a pattern that uh, firms with lots of low wage workers, the, we define them in the survey as those who make less than twenty eight thousand dollars, having a, a, a meaningful share of your workforce make uh, below that threshold end up having lower premiums and higher contributions, meaning the employer is chipping in less and the, the worker ends up chipping in more. That's been the pattern over the years. I, I'd have to look to see if that's true this year. But there's definitely more affordability issues for um, low wage workers who have obviously lower incomes to, to meet higher levels of cost sharing. Gary, did you have anything on that? Did you, yeah, you remember? Um, I mean, over time we, the, the sort of shares of the premium that workers face are relatively consistent, you know, 16 to 18% for single, it went up a little bit um, on average and, you know, around uh, 28 to 30 for family coverage. Um, obviously the family coverage number is a big number, but um, one of the things that Matt showed was that there's distributions around that and particularly in small firms, there are a fair number where the worker has to pay more than half the premium for family coverage. And I, th I think we probably realize there's not a lot of people choosing family coverage in those circumstances. So the averages do tell us something, but we also have to pay attention to some of the distributions, which again, we have a lot of that in the report. Um, uh, for single coverage, often the contribution is relatively low in small firms and that that um, to try in part because the firm has to get a certain percentage of the workers to enroll in order to get the coverage in the first place. So um, in some ways that can be more affordable, but then trying to add family members can be difficult. Yeah, I guess it's like so far premium, increase, premium increases have hit both workers and employers. They're both having to chip in more money every year over time to, to make up for the rising premiums. And why, you know, you know, a, a persistent result over time has been that that small firms are much less likely than, than larger firms to, to offer coverage uh, to, to their workers. Um, why, uh, why is that the case? Well, I mean, I think in general, the average compensation levels in small firms are lower than in larger firms. And health benefits are part of the overall compensation and fitting in a decent health benefit along with wages that people want um, to get them to work just doesn't just doesn't fit within the kind of level of productivity and the amount that those those firms are paying people. Um, so you you know smaller firms this is obviously not true across the board. There are small boutique law firms <laughs> with with millionaires, but in general it's there's 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 less productivity 
activity in those firms in terms of what they're bringing in. And so they pay a little bit less and they can't fit in a good benefit. Um, there, there isn't any magic to, to making that $22,000 premium less unless you could find a way to find providers who are taking less. And so far we haven't really seen an interest in, you know, the, you know, in narrow networks or something else that would potentially get at that cost issue. Otherwise, someone's got to pay for it either through cost sharing or through higher premiums. One of the things that's definitely true is, is there are administrative burdens for offering health benefits. So, and those administrative burdens are heavier when you've got fewer HR people at your firm. So, especially amongst the super small firms, the three to nine employees who make up a big part of that statistic, you know, lots of those, there's a whole bunch of situations there. People may have other coverage options, so it may not be beneficial. People may not want to see their health benefits in terms of uh, their compensation in terms of health benefits rather than wages. We've got uh, data on that in, in section two. We do ask a whole battery of questions this year on um, why small firms don't offer. Uh, cost tends to be or is the dominant reason, but followed by that is people have other coverage options or think they can get a better deal somewhere else. Um, so uh, sticking with, with all small firms, we, we had a couple questions about, several questions about um, uh, small firms contributing towards uh, uh, ACA, Affordable Care Act marketplace coverage uh, for their workers, uh, for example, using uh, uh, ICRA, and uh, I'll leave it to you guys to explain what ICRA is, um, and, uh, and whether the, the expanded premium tax credits, premium subsidies, uh, in ACA marketplace plans created by the American Rescue Plan uh, has had any effect on a migration out of em employer-sponsored health, health insurance? I think overall, in the past we've asked about, we've asked employers that don't offer health benefits if they make some funds available to workers to um, to buy coverage in the individual market, and I, I think it was something like I think it's seven. Pardon me. I think it's seven, but I can pull it up. Yeah, it, it's 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 a relatively small share that said that they, and then that's been reasonably consistent. And that did, and we we changed the question this year and specifically referenced ICRA, um, and it didn't change for the non-offering employers. Uh, we, we did have a few offering employers who, who offer, who, who say that they provide some employees with um, funds to buy in the individual market as well as offering a benefit plan to other employees. But we didn't see a big response in this. And we, ha and we had question about whether people were likely to do this in the future, but we didn't get enough response to really be able to say much about it. So I don't think it's I, I don't think it was a thing this year. Overwhelming firms were not we were not anticipating they've moved uh, to an individual co coverage health reimbursement arrangement, which is a way that an employer can make money available to an employee so they can purchase non-group coverage. So the non-group coverage would be the coverage not sponsored by the benefit. So um, which I think there was some anticipation that that would be a larger number than it ended up being this year. I mean, I should say we know that employers say they were doing it in the past, even though there didn't seem to be a way they should have been able to do it. So we, we I, I don't know how strictly people follow what, what all the rules here or even understand all the rules here, but, but we didn't see a big change in people saying yes. And we, we found even smaller percentage. So a firm, we, we asked the question separately. We asked, do you provide funds to employees to, uh, to purchase non-group coverage? And did you provide social funds to an ICRA here? And we have a smaller share saying they were using an ICRA. Great, so we, we had a couple questions uh, back back to high deductibles. Um, a, lot, a lot of questions about high deductibles, in, in, in fact. Um, we had a couple questions specifically about employers uh, offering, uh, eliminating cost sharing uh, for uh, chronic diseases. Um, uh, uh, in advance of, of the deductible. Uh, one question about the percentage of employers who, who change their pre-deductible coverage 
uh, in response to an IRS rule, which I believe we asked about uh, last year. Any any update on on any of that information? We didn't ask any of those questions last year, uh, this year, but last year we did ask uh, whether you waived cost sharing for maintenance drugs. Um, and if I remember correctly, it's on three and 10 large firms did, but that's in the 2020 report. And we did ask about the changes to the IRS rule for the HSF qualified plans. I, I don't remember that number off the top of my head, um, but it's uh, all of the 2020 report is still available online. We just and the 2021 on, so you can go back in time and see all the greatest hits from the Employer Health Benefit Survey. Um, so we have, uh, switching gears a little bit, we had a, a, a bunch of technical questions about the survey. Uh, so, so one, going back to, to what you presented, Matt, about the, the trend in premiums uh, over premiums and deductibles over time versus uh, worker earnings. Can, can you talk uh, just a bit about, about how we define worker earnings, what, that, what that's measuring? Uh, yeah, no, it's a good question. It's really important. Um, I'm happy to take methodological questions as well. Um, so we get we get that data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's non-supervisory employees, um, and there's a link to the actual trend from the BLS that has got a full method stuff to me explaining it. It's measured for the first three months of the year, uh, the year-over-year -year average. So the way to say that would be between. Uh, the average wage for work, non supervisory workers went up 5% between within the January to March period. Uh, and we had one specific question about whether that that is uh, earnings or take home pay and and uh, it would not be take home pay after taxes it's 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 the the earnings before taxes. Correct. Yes. Um, also had a, a question about uh, in inflation. Uh, again, you know, with the, the announcement today of year-over-year -year inflation in October, uh, topping six percent, which is quite a bit higher than what we show in the report. Can you uh, just back up a little bit and describe how how we're measuring inflation and, and sure. why? Yeah, it's exactly the same way. We get the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The same link is uh, it's the same data source that was from the report today. Just we're looking at a different period, and we're using the January to March period. The only reason we're picking that period is because uh, me and Gary need time to write the report. So we have to have the figures ready to insert. Um, and um, that is sort of the period in which we're asking the question. In an ideal universe, we're fielding the survey between January and early spring. Um, yeah, almost any, any way we choose to measure this, we, we run into, I mean, if we pick like April to April, we'll pick it, we'll, we'll hit a year when food prices or gasoline prices spiked in a month and it'll be different than the rest of the year would have been. Um, in this case, because of the pandemic and all the things that went on, we had rich, you know, we had low inflation at the beginning of the year, now we have a lot of inflation. Um, so uh, people can just take what we, you know, we can just say what we've done and, but they can obviously also say, well, now inflation is higher. Um, but in my mind, it really underscores some of the findings, especially on coverage and cost. Um, we didn't, we reserved some long-term trends of stability here um, with pre-pandemic pre trends, uh, as opposed to where a lot of our indicators are moving around a lot, showing some significant movement in the economy. I guess I would also add that one reason we sort of, and, and we have this report, you pay attention to like the five-year you know, you pay attention to longer periods and you can look at the inflation over a long, a much longer period point to point and those kinds of fluctuations average out and um, can have a much better sense of, of how premiums are being or, or contributions or deductibles or whatever you're looking at compared to those metrics over a longer period of time. Uh, and, and one uh, very wonky question about, um, uh, the, the collection of the data, um, whether we saw a decline in response rate or an increase in response rate uh, uh, in, in uh, recent years, whether remote work had a, an impact on, on the fielding of the survey uh, this year and last, and, um, and what benchmarks we use to, to weight the data. Oh, no, that's a great question. So um, I think like every major survey, federal survey or, or surveys administered by organizations like ours, we've seen a decrease in response rates over the last uh, decade. So our response rate this year was 15%. Um, now our response rates, our response rate 
decreased. Um, we, I don't think the decrease was more precipitous than the decrease we sort of are the general trending downward decrease. Um, I do, I wouldn't be surprised if work from home made an impact on trying to get, find people on the phone, to give the, ask them to give their time to, generously give their time to make this, make it possible for us to put this survey out. Um, but we don't have, we don't have a good way of measuring that. In terms of the weighting, we wait to counts from the uh, Census Bureau's uh, statistics of U.S. businesses, which has counts of workers and firms by industry and state. So we wait to sell. And, and sorry, okay. state size and industry. Sorry, Gary. Um, so we wait to those totals, and then the the main weight is the, the covered worker weight. How I many? When we say the premium is the average premium amongst covered workers. And that's calculated based upon the share of workers at the firm who are covered by health benefits. Now Great. that's going to that kind of cover it. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, we had a number of, of questions about uh, self-funded, self-insured uh, plans. And, and Gary talked a, a little bit about, about this. Um, uh, Gary, if you could you could just talk a little bit more about uh, sort of self-funding generally, uh, why why employers might self and fund, but self fund both small employers uh, and and large large employers. What what requirements differ for self-funded versus uh, insured, fully insured employers, uh, and and also particularly a little bit more about this potential trend we might be seeing among smaller employers. Um, sure, uh, without getting too much into a class about ERISA, which is difficult. Um, uh, Self-funding is when an employer pays their health benefits from their own bank account, as opposed to transferring the risk to an insurer. Um, many firms self, who self-fund also, uh, sorry, many firms that self-fund also buy what's called stop-loss coverage that will limit their potential risk either on a per employee or a, an aggregate basis. Uh, there are different, uh, most large firms self-fund and there are some differences here between public and private firms. Uh, private firms are covered by ERISA when they self-fund, which means that state regulations about insurance generally don't apply to them. Public firms are often state-based public organizations and they make their own rules, but they still may self-fund without buying from insurance from an insurer. Uh, the primary reason that a large employer would self-fund is they have more control over what they offer. And the larger you are, the more you can kind of dictate your own terms to the, the people who want to administer it. You don't pay premium tax, which is a big deal and you don't have to um, follow state requirements on what benefits you have to offer. Um, those are probably the primary reasons. Um, and I missed, and so, so I'll, 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 I'll do the small firm part. I'm trying to think if anything else I should do about the large firm. That's great. So the only other point Gary that maybe make is that the other reason large firms just have enough employees that they can spread the risk over a larger pool right. of people. Yeah, I mean, for a large firm, even if they bought insurance, they would be rated on their own health experience from an insurance company. So they're going to be rated on their own experience. It's, it's either they're going to pay their own experience through their bank account or pay an insurer based on their own experience and then have to add those, the markup for the insurer taking the risk and the premium debts and stuff. So it's, it's, it's cost effective to self-fund and most large employers do it. Um, Smaller firms have a difficulty self-funding because on, on a pure basis, because the fewer workers you have, the more likely that one or two outliers could, could cost you well more than your expected costs. Um, as, you, as firms get smaller and they still wanna get the benefits of self-funding, they tend to buy stop loss coverage that is more protective. So they face a lower amount of exposure per worker and maybe they, and that's called specific stop loss. 
And maybe they also buy an aggregate stop loss policy, which says if your expected costs are 10, then you'll not have to pay more than 11 or 11 you know, or 12. Um, so it, it, it limits how much they can lose. In recent years, these level funded plans I was talking about, and they have different names. Um, Anthem calls them balanced funding. Aetna has the Aetna, the Aetna funding advantage and United has alternate funding. Um, Cigna has level funding. Uh, they are starting to offer a self-funded plan down to very small employees, uh, very, very small employers who wouldn't, who would never realistically self-fund if they bore all the risk. But what they do is take the expected claim, uh, the, well, for one thing, unlike other small employers of that size, these plans are medically underwritten. So they look at the health status of the employees they, and the age and the other risk determinants, they figure out a, an expected cost for the group. They split that into a bit uh, that the employer would pay out of their account. And then the premiums that the employer would pay for both a specific and an aggregate stop loss policy, they bundle all that together and divide it into 12 easy payments and it looks like a premium but it's called self-funding. At the end of the year, the employer may get back a little bit of money if people are even healthier than expected. Uh, they may, uh, but there's usually very little upside risk, if any. Um, but again, you get the advantages of calling yourself self-funded. There's, um, there might be premium tax that you have to pay on the stop loss, but you're not subject to mandated benefits. You're not subject to the essential health benefits. It can be health status underwritten. Um, the, the risk for the employers is that the coverage isn't necessarily guaranteed renewable. So if someone gets sick, your premium may go way up and then you'll shuffle off into the insured market. And then over the long term, you basically have the potential that the uh, regulated market will see its premiums go up because the healthier groups will go only into these plans. Um, so that's why it's worth watching in the future. Obviously, they're, they're very popular. And so it's um, whether or not it's going to be stable over time is something we'll see. Well, Gary, as you said, there are risks to wading into uh, ERISA and self-funding. And um, uh, your answer raised a couple additional questions that people asked. Okay. Uh, so one is the about the you mentioned that that uh, self-funded employers do not have to pay uh, state state premium taxes. Uh, roughly, what are those? How do what's the range? I'm I'm thinking three percent, two three percent. I mean, you were you were a regulator too. Um, HMOs sometimes have lower sometimes have lower premium taxes. Um, I've seen it as high as four, but I don't know. Um, but it's 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 three percent maybe in in some states. Uh, so it's certainly, certainly enough to make a difference. Um, yeah, when, I mean, when you're a big employer and you're paying millions and millions of dollars, um, yeah, it's, it it adds up, and and it doesn't serve you in any way. And uh, and you talked about uh, obviously in a in a self funded arrangement or or even in an experience rated insured arrangement for an, a large a large employer, uh, the employer is paying uh, higher health benefit costs if it has a sicker workforce. Uh, what are the protections in place to ensure that these firms uh, uh, don't try to avoid hiring workers based on their their actual or perceived healthcare use? Um. The American with Disabilities Act, it's illegal to hire people based on their health status. Yep, simple answer. Um, the, uh, I, I mean, I will say the mark, I, I will say the, the marketing for the level funded plans uses the word health and healthy employees quite a bit, and, and who it's directed at is the word health is used a lot. Um, so we have a few questions about the effects of, of COVID on, on uh, employer health insurance costs. One, one question in particular about uh, uh, a, um, 
a, a fight going on in Los Angeles within the fire department uh, over a, a vaccine mandate for fire department in employees. Um, so the question is kind of what, what, what effect does COVID vaccination, uh, what effect has that had on, on uh, costs for employers? And maybe, maybe I'll start and then uh, Matt, Gary, feel free to, to jump in. Um, uh, you know, I think that there are a number of important things to keep in mind. One is the, the, the cost of the actual uh, back vaccination. Um, you know, employers uh, do have to cover the cost of administering vaccines um, uh, for their, their employees, but the, the vaccines themselves uh, were purchased by the federal government. So at least for the foreseeable future, uh, employers are not covering the cost of the, the actual vaccines. Um, you know, throughout the pandemic, particularly early on in the pandemic, uh, even with the costs of people getting sick from, from COVID, uh, in general, healthcare spending uh, dropped as, as people um, uh, delayed or, or skipped care, particularly uh, elective procedures, but not only elective procedures. Um, a lot of that spending uh, has come back, but uh, still seems to be below the pre-COVID baseline. So while uh, while people are using healthcare now more than they were earlier in the pandemic, uh, it, it seems that at least uh, um, for now, the overall level of health spending is, is not up to, to the level it was uh, before the pandemic. Um, and then the question of, of kind of what a vaccine mandate uh, might do, um, you know, we have seen and we've put out some analysis uh, there, you know, there, there have been billions in, in costs for preventable hospitalizations from, from people who are uh, unvaccinated. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's, it's quite clear that, uh, that having more employees vaccinated um, should not only uh, lower healthcare costs uh, for employers, uh, but also all kinds of other expenses associated with uh, absences uh, among workers who have to quarantine because they're not vaccinated. And Gary, Matt, any anything you want to add? No. We didn't really do a lot on this. And the survey, obviously, this was a moving target during our field period. The only thing we kind of added on this was the cost to the cost sharing when when, when you uh, someone who's become infected with COVID and needs treatment. There's some. Uh, we did a report using employer health benefit survey with uh, on our partnership with the Peterson Health System Tracker. We just got an exp explanation of that issue. Uh, but in general, it seems like employers are moving away from waiving cost sharing for employees who become, become infected. Right, employers and, and insurers more generally yes, as, yeah. as well have been moving away from, from waiving, waiving cost sharing for, uh, for COVID treatment now that vaccines are, are readily available and, uh, and largely prevent severe illness. Um, so, uh, uh, Gary and Matt, was, uh, I'm not sure which one of you talked about uh, uh, kind of narrower networks as, as one way of, of lowering costs. I think it was, it was you, Gary. Yeah. Um, and, and we had a num number of questions about that. One, kind of what is, what is the barrier? What are the barriers to employers uh, narrowing networks uh, to, to achieve uh, lower costs? Um, and, and have we done any, uh, in the survey, have we done any measurement of, of uh, whether more employers are, are choosing a, a narrower network? We did not ask about it this year. Uh, again, the, the COVID focus. Um, it's a question we ask every other year, every third year. So um, there's some things in the prior surveys um, and, and they're not very popular. Um, I, I think there's a couple reasons. Uh, one is that employees don't necessarily like it. And like I said, people like in their employer, you know, their employee benefits to be popular. And um, it's a little hard to tell the CEO that they're not gonna be able to go to the flagship hospital. Um, I, but, but another reason is there's a lot of employers I mean, most workers work for larger employers and a lot of larger employers are in multiple places. And if you have workers everywhere, it's hard to find a vendor who has a narrow network solution that is you know, viable and attractive in multiple places where your workers might be. So it's hard enough to just match up getting an insurer um, 
to getting in, you know, a vendor who has the kind of network you want and all the places your plant locations or your retail outlets may be, but getting one that has an attractive narrow network is, is hard. Um, about two years ago, we did some focus groups with some pretty large employers, not the hugest ones, but some pretty about this. And we asked this particular question and more of them said they had to work with their carriers to expand the networks where they had, the, where, where they had plans in order to get sort of a satisfactory situation as opposed to looking to narrow them. So it just wasn't even on the radar that this was something that could happen. Um, so we're unfortunately coming up to the uh, end of the hour. Um, and I just want to ask one final question of, of each of you. Um, you know, we're in open enrollment for, for many employers now, in addition to the Affordable Care Act and, and Medicare. Uh, um, looking ahead, I mean, during open enrollment, looking ahead to the next year, what, what are a couple of things each of you are, are looking for uh, in, in employer health benefits? And uh, Gary, maybe start with you. Um, yeah, it makes it easy. Then, then we may have to come up with something else. Um, I, I, I think we're going to want to follow up on how the telemedicine stuff plays out, um, whether or not there's going to be a little concern about employers about opening the, flood the floodgates to utilization or whether the, how the cost sharing will, will, will work on that and what kinds of requirements might be put in place what they're willing to pay for going forward. And related to that is how, because um, we're still, I mean, I think we think in at least the foundation, we hope that we're going to be back and work in January, but there's still a lot of people working from home. Um, how are the mental health benefits going to be playing out? Um, how, uh, I raised the question about substance abuse. So, so how, how do we sort of figure out these emotional supports that people seem to need um, and how our employer plan is going to continue to try to deal with that. Um, so those are questions we're going to be asking about. Um, yeah, no, look, I think mental health is a big one. This year, next year, and for the foreseeable future, employers are going to be thinking about how to make the mental health benefits work for their employees. I think the calls we do with employers that both me and Gary have done, I think we saw a lot of employers scrambling over the last year to figure out what are the sort of interventions that they can do, which are meaningful for employees and make it to make a difference and are meeting people and sort of what's been a tremendously changing situation. Um, so that's something we're obviously going to think about asking pointed and good and useful questions for everybody in 2022. I think going forward, thinking about coverage is still going to be interesting. We saw that we did not really see a decline in coverage within um, from among workers being covered by their own plan. So we're going to continue to think of ways to ask good questions about who's enrolling in the plan. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, for what it's worth, there's lots more on the mental health piece, both in this survey as well as we we published a peer-reviewed article in the journal Health Affairs that also being released today. And I think we made a special emphasis on the mental health piece within that article. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks, Matt and, and Gary. And thanks to all of you for, for joining us. Uh, and as Matt said, uh, there is much, much more on uh, kff.org uh, from, from the survey, in addition to the uh, 22 previous years uh, of, of the survey. Uh, and a reminder that the recording, a recording of this briefing will be posted on kff.org later today as well. So thanks again for joining us.